Um, so hi, I'm Bridget. I'm a current student at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm so excited to be moderating this panel along with Sophia. Sophia, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Sophia and I'm the project manager for 1600 Avenue. It's a pleasure to meet you all. Yeah, so the theme of and the topic of this panel is game changers when you think you can't, how you can. And we're so excited to be here with Gordon Williams, Denise Taylor, and Ashley Monty. Do you all want to go ahead and maybe have a little one line blurb about yourself? I start. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. How you doing? Uh, Gordon Williams. I'm a producer and engineer, probably most known for uh, working with uh, some notable female artists, including Lauren Hill, Amy Winehouse, uh, Josh Stone, and Alicia Keys. And I'm very happy to be here today with all you wonderful, powerful women. I can go next. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Madney, and I'm a systems engineer at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory based out of Los Angeles, California, and I'm so excited to be here today. I'll go next. Hi, I'm Denise Taylor, and I'm the co-founder and CEO at Privacy Vaults Online. We're known in the marketplace as Privo, and you would see our kids' privacy and safety assured trust marks in the footer of some really well-known brands. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Wow, thank you guys all so much. That's just amazing. So kind of building off your backgrounds, how did you get into your career path and area of expertise, and what passions drove you there? We can start with Gordon. Um, I think my passion, uh, it really starts with, um, it really starts at home, you know, with, uh, with my mom. You know, I grew up in a, in a single parent household with a very strong mother. And this also resonates with the theme of this, this, uh, this meeting, this panel here. Um, I think music was the thing that once I discovered it, I, there was no turning back. And that, that happened for me at a relatively young age and um, it's first as a DJ. So I grew up in the uh, Northeast section of the Bronx where, you know, at a time when hip hop was, it wasn't something that was on the radio, it was something that you heard in the neighborhood. So our early inspirations were um, people that we saw just around, you know, we, we were, we were, it wasn't, you know, you can imagine, it's hard to even actually imagine it now seeing the phenomena of the music and it being a worldwide thing, but imagine, um, be, being almost in a secret club. It was kind of like that, you know, the music just was something that you heard if you were from the neighborhood. So it was something that also made us feel special, like we had something that was our own. And, and that was really my intro into getting into music. That's great. Thank you. And then maybe you can just continue in the same order that we int did introductions. Um, yeah, so uh, I think the question was, how did we get into our career path? Um, for me, when I was growing up, when I was a little kid, I was always really fascinated by space, but because I didn't have any, maybe it's because I didn't have any female um, engineers or scientists in my family, I didn't think there was a place for me in the world of STEM. And so it wasn't until I got to high school and I had this really amazing physics professor who encouraged me to pursue engineering and said, you know, I think you'd be a really great fit for this. Um, and then, of course, when I got to college and was in the engineering school, I saw that there were, you know, it wasn't 50-50 male and female, but there were other women pursuing that too, um, which was really encouraging. So, you know, I took a bit of a, a slow start to realize I wanted to be in STEM, but um, yeah, got there eventually. Well, for me, um like Ashley, I uh, was a little entrepreneur as a child too, thinking about the future. And along came my brother in late 1999 and said, hey, there's this thing called the internet and we need a family business on it. And I said, I know already, I have, one, I have an email. And I think that was the beginning of my understanding of what was to come. Uh, I had uh, signed up to participate with him in a company he called InfoNuts where kids and Folks are nutty about information and they would bring their nutty ideas and create products and services. And we had companies that would take those collaborations and turn them into real things and reward them with nut bucks and spend it in the community. 
So how does that impact me today, 20 years later? Well, we tripped over a law called the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act that said you can't let children come on and share their data and talk to others without first obtaining verifiable parental consent. And being the recovering CPA that I am, thinking just about the expense side of the house, how are we going to do that, um, and also looking out in the marketplace and seeing that the bubble of the what was the Internet, the beginnings, uh, was bursting, I thought, hmm, maybe we need a way to bank our information, verify who we are, associate our loved ones, and manage consent across you know, like-minded companies who abide by the rules. So we formed Privacy Vaults Online, or as I mentioned, Privo, and that's how, that's how I got started. Wow. I mean, the goal of Privo is a big one, and this question can go for anyone, but Denise, were there any unexpected challenges that you overcame when you were going through this large process? And if so, how'd you overcome them? And are there any specific resources that you could share with people if they encounter similar challenges along the way? Sure. Um, well, challenges are many. Um, so it's not, uh, it's not child's play getting into uh, the business of being an entrepreneur and trying to drive a dream home. Um, I, I think the biggest challenge for me is that, you know, being more pragmatic and that kind of accounting person, that accounting finance person on one side of my brain, um, I never could have contemplated that my very favorite brands in the world uh, would be very slow to do the right thing by children and that instead we would find ourselves creating a generation of fakers and fibbers at the age gate of every online service uh, and as we went along apps and platforms and, and the like. And uh, you know, I, I never could have contemplated that, that enforcement of a law could take ver uh, you know, many, many years, that it would require here in the good old US uh, other companies or other countries, I should say, actually implementing uh, as you know, perhaps stronger regulations around the protection of children's privacy and safety in order to wake up this side of the pond to do what was right by kids. So my biggest challenge has been ignorance and abstinence and overcoming that with grit and perseverance uh, to thankfully be standing today and I see many companies turning now, uh, maybe with a little nudge, uh, but turning towards doing the right thing. So. Wow, thank you. That was so well said. Ashley or Gordon, do you want to chime in? Ashley, ladies first. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest challenges I've had in pursuing my career um, started when I was in undergrad. So I started my college experience studying biomedical engineering and realized my junior year, that's really not what I wanted to do. So I had to make the really hard decision to, first of all, figure out what my passion was and kind of going back to my childhood dream of being fascinated by space um, and figuring out, well, okay, it's too late for me to change majors. So how can I actually pivot um, in a way to make my dreams a reality? So um, my university didn't have an aerospace engineering department, but I reached out to all the professors in the physics department mechanical engineering, all of my academic advisors, just to find maybe research opportunities or other ways to supplement my degree so that I could apply to that NASA internship and you know, eventually apply to grad school for aerospace engineering to set myself up for success for this pretty major pivot in my educational and, and career aspirations. Um, so that was a challenge that I tried to hit kind of head on um, and I, I'm so glad that I made that hard decision my junior year um, so that today I'm actually working in a field that I'm so excited to be part of. Great. Thank you. As a current college student, it's great to hear your experience. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and Gordon? Um, ask me the question again, Bridget. Yeah, sure. Um, were there any unexpected challenges that you overcame? And if so, how'd you overcome them? And then even more specifically, if there's any resources that you could share with people that they could use if they encounter similar challenges. Um, you know, it's, you mean to start, like what were the challenges begin in, when I was beginning my career or just, you know, just in general? Yeah, at any point in your career path, if there's anything that you think, yeah, it's something that you overcame at your start yeah, of your okay. career path. Is I think, I think probably 
as because I was thinking as um the two uh, two women were speaking that um for me it's probably been a being being able to listen. I had to learn at a certain point that listening was very important, especially when you're given a role of leadership, which I think over the years I've sort of fallen into that role. And um, you know, you you tend to at the beginning think that a leader is someone that has to, you know, speak all the time. And um, most times, actually, it's a leader needs to listen. And I think if if as you get older or you or you move on, I don't necessarily mean physical age, as you just get more experience, that you you learn that. And I think that if you as a young person, if you can pick that up, it will serve you. Um, it will serve you well as you as you move on in your career. Great, thank you. And now I'll turn over to Sophia. Um, so thank you so much for your contribution so far. Um, and so looking at, even looking at the attendees here, I also wanted to ask what the role of mentorship has been in your lives or in your career path. Um, are you, or will you be a mentor to others? Are you willing or are you open to that? And um, in, in what kind of role did mentorship play um, in your current career path as well? And how important do you think mentorship is? So it's, it's a packed question, but then it's basically, we're basically asking how important you think mentorship is if you're open to uh, mentoring people, even any of our attendees here, and um, what role mentorship played in your life. So maybe we can start with um, Denise. Thank you. Um, well, I have to uh, steal one from Gordon and go back to <laughs> mentorship in the family is so, so important. So for me, my father uh, was an entrepreneur. Um, he was my, you know, I was so respectful of him and impressed by him. And uh, I look back at a paper that I had written when I was in college, an English paper, you know, do I want to be an entrepreneur or something to that effect? And I went out and interviewed some of the local business people, businessmen primarily. I don't think I knew any women at the time that were in business. Uh, and my father said one thing to me. He said, you never give up. You never give up. You never give up. If you're on the right path, you have to have the stick to it to, to, to do that. So I look back at that mentor. And then, you know, over the years, I have amassed a huge network of people. And I am the gal who would go to the conference and stand in line to shake the hand. Hi, I'm Denise Taylor, and I'm the CEO of, and I had to educate everybody along the way and gather many, many relationships. And so I found that I have just wonderful people who care about my success and the success of my business across many facets of my business. And so there isn't an issue that arises that I can't pick up the phone or, you know, use some other means of communication to get a quick answer. What do you think? And I think that also what's very important about that is that they have to know you. You know, if a mentor is a, a lecturer, or, you know, you do it this way, it doesn't, it's hard to receive. So, you know, you've got to make sure that you pick the people who actually can perhaps tolerate you uh, and, you know, uh, really look to make what you have, your little gems, much better. Um, and I think that's really key. So for me, becoming a mentor, gee, I've been so heads down for so long that I find that um, although I do accost parents in the grocery store and in restaurants and in the, you know, at the gas station to ask them what they're doing to keep their kids safe online, maybe that constitutes a mentor of some, in some regard, but I'm going to be more deliberate about finding people who might be able to benefit from, from what I can share. And I think as success continues to come, you know, perhaps it'll feel uh, more natural for me to, to slice off some more of my day to help somebody else achieve their, their goals. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Denise. And how about you, Ashley? Yeah, um, I loved uh, just to build upon some of what Denise said. I think so much of finding good mentors is about quality over quantity and finding someone who you know, really gets you and your goals and someone who you aspire to be similar to in your future career. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of having 100 mentors and you meet with them for 15 minutes, you know, once a year, 
finding those few really good ones that you can develop a really deep, strong relationship with. And you can really depend on, you know, if something comes up at work, a challenge or an interpersonal conflict, you can go to them as, you know, an advisor, as a sounding board, or, you know, particularly if you're, you know, looking for a new role in your organization or outside of one, they can be on the lookout for you and, and recommend you, um, you know, for new, you know, maybe stretch goals that you didn't believe you were capable of doing yourself. So, yeah, I think for me, it's mentors have been a huge part of my career. And I think it's important to find mentors who, you know, have similar, um, you know, career aspirations, maybe someone who's kind of that next step down the line and who you want to be in five years, but also someone who you want to be in, in 20 years to get kind of that diversity of, of perspective. Okay. Um, and for me, you know, I've really enjoyed being able to mentor some of the newer engineers at, at JPL um, and especially the summer interns when they come through um, just to kind of give them advice and, and hope that, you know, they don't have to figure out exactly what they want to do when they're 20 years old, that there's a whole plethora of career opportunities for them, you know, in the world of STEM. Um, but, but yes, that's just to say that mentoring is hugely important. And um, I love, you know, having my mentoring relationships, um, both, both up and down. And how about you, Gordon? Um, yeah, I think it, it's, it's extremely, the mentor mentee relationship is extremely important. And as both, um, Ashley and Denise said, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering if I didn't meet Denise in another life because listen to her speak, it sound, I, it's like, I think we've been on a similar path in that, um, you know, the growth that comes through, uh, that comes through building your business or building your 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 journey, as she said, it's a life journey because we we can't quit, right? We have to keep on going, and there's going to be success, and there's going to be failure with with every success and new relationships, right? So that mentee mentor relationship, I think, happens a lot of times organically. You know, I read somewhere they said, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher will show up, right? So I think you just have to be able to recognize when those people, those significant people show up. Um, one, of the, one of my most significant mentors was Quincy Jones. And I got an opportunity to spend time around him from in my formative years in entertainment when I really started getting into major labels, which was around, you know, <laughs> without dating myself. When I was in, when I was in my, when my later uh, teens, I was I, my first record deal, I got a chance to meet Quincy and that turned into a relationship that lasted uh, pretty intensely for around three years in terms of communication. And uh, one of the things he said to me was, um, you know, people recognize him at that time as having won the most Grammy awards. He, I think he had 27 or 28 at the time. He said, but you know, for, uh, he, was, he was nominated over 90 times. So if you look at his success to failure ratio, he actually lost more than he won, but, but the wins were big wins. So you only remember the wins, but for him, you know, each loss hurt, you know, every time you get nominated, I mean, imagine the music that he may have liked personally may not have necessarily been the music that he was most commercially successful for. So that loss to him on a jazz album may have, may have even hurt him more than say the win on a big pop record. So to the public, the public would see that as, you know, what are you talking about? It's Quincy Jones, look at all these accolades, but each time you lose, you have to get back up and go back to the well again to, you know, look for water. So I think having mentors that have experienced that. I think it was Denise who said that, you know, everybody that's, or, or, or no, maybe that was um, um, Marla, that uh, for everybody that's won, they've had to have lost and, and probably had very significant losses, maybe even losses that got them to a point that you feel like you're gonna stop. And I think that relationship, having a, a mentor that has experienced that, it's, it's those words at that time that could be the difference between you going forward or, you know, feeling like the sky has fallen, it's over, I can't, I don't have, a, I can't see another way. So I think that, that it's very key to have the, that mentee-mentor relationship. And even now for the mentor, the, the mentee a lot of times becomes a source of, of reminder of maybe who you used to be, 
you know, and where, and where, where you were when you were coming and you didn't really know as much as maybe you thought you did. So I think it also provides growth to the mentor. So I think that that's a very important relationship in, in, in any business. And you're very fortunate when you find on both sides, when you find the right um, person. So I'm always looking for um, mm -hmm. young people to, to kind of impart that to, but, but I've learned now to just, again, like I said, listen a little more, watch them before you jump in. But when you, <laughs> when you find a good one, you know, hold on to them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I think so for the last question, I mean, just even one person can just answer, but then we just want to ask, um, so if you have a chance to go back um, in time, 10 years ago, what would you tell your younger self? I mean, maybe one person can answer, then we can. Answer that, Denise. I want to hear that. I'm going to say to be a little less hard on myself, huh. to uh, listen a little better, be more, you know, be respectful, learn, but don't let the naysayers get in in between the, the ears. Um, you really have to believe in yourself and Thank believe in your mission and stay on course. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So now we are moving on to the next, the next panel.